Welcome to the Key Chapters of the Bible podcast. This is a daily podcast that's going through the key chapters of God's Word. As students of the Bible, we should read and know the Bible really well. But sometimes that means we're going to be studying passages that at first glance might not seem very applicable to our lives today. Today in our study in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, it might seem like one of those passages, but I'm excited to study this chapter with you because we're going to look at it from the perspective of how to study and apply passages that don't seem to be speaking to our lives today. So welcome to the Key Chapters podcast. I'm Russ Brewer, pastor of Wellington Community Church in Wellington, Colorado. This is our daily podcast. It's going through the key chapters of the Bible, one chapter per day. And today we're studying 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and Paul's closing comments to the church in Corinth. Now, as we turn to chapter 16, I just have to mention that the primary reason why I'm including this chapter in our list of key chapters is just to finish out the entire book of Corinthians. Uh, This chapter, it's not filled with heavy theology or deep concepts. Instead, these are mostly Paul's closing comments that button up this letter. We're going to find that this last chapter just follows Paul's customary way of ending letters that he's written. He's going to include some final thoughts, some practical updates, some personal encouragements, and and some final exhortations. In many ways, this passage is like literally reading someone else's mail. And yet this passage also gives us a case study for how we can read passages like this and still grow in Christ. So let's talk about some principles of how to find personal applications in the scriptures. How do we read a passage like this and personally benefit from it in the way that the author intended? Well, that's a great question. And the answer starts with understanding the basic reason for all Bible study. Why do we study the Bible anyway? Well, we study it because these are the documents of the covenant that God has made with his people. The Bible tells us who God is and who we are and how he wants to live as new covenant Christians. And so we should approach every passage of scripture with three basic questions. What does the text say? What does it mean? And how do we live it? Too often, we read a passage and jump directly to the question of, how do I live it? And and we read it almost like it's a fortune cookie that can mean one thing today, a different thing tomorrow, uh, just kind of depending on my opinions, depending on my circumstances, how much sleep I got. And that's not how we're supposed to approach the Word of God. The Word of God has been inspired by the Holy Spirit and given to us for specific reasons. Our job is not to find our meaning in a passage or what it means to us. Our job is to find out what does it mean to the Lord and what does He want us to do with it. And sometimes scripture is given to us as a record of what happened. It's just all it is just recording what happened. And it may not be prescribing for us direct application for our lives. Other times it might just be data to let us know what's going on and understand the entire tapestry of scripture. This passage today, 1 Corinthians 16, it's got, it's got all of this. And so as we work through this passage, we're going to have to do some work to see how it applies to our lives today. And the first way we do that is by looking for prescriptive truths. Now, what are prescriptive truths? Prescriptive truths are specific teachings that are being given in a passage, instructions, prescriptions for how to live. Sometimes a prescriptive teaching is going to be to specific people. We're going to see that here throughout chapter 16. But a lot of times, prescriptive truth is for all people in all generations. And it's the kind of things we've been seeing as we've been going through the letter to the Corinthians. But even when it's not, like today, when we go to this passage and and we're like, this is really written to different people, not me, we can still glean principles for our lives today. And so to find prescriptive truths, let's skim this passage looking for verses or teachings where Paul is prescribing some truth or some way of life. If you want, go ahead and pause this podcast. I won't be offended. Pause it, make a note or circle the verses or, or, or make notes of the specific verses that are actually telling the people something to do. Then come back and, and let's talk about what you found. Okay, so go ahead and pause it. All right, hopefully you're back. And we've been looking for a prescriptive truths where Paul is prescribing something for them or for us to know and live. And you have probably notated, if you've gone through this and made some kind of notation, you've probably notated verses 1 to 3 where Paul instructs him about taking a collection, verses 10 and 11 where Paul instructs him about Timothy's visit, verses 13 and 14 where Paul instructs him about the general conduct of life, verses 15, 16, and 18 where Paul instructs them regarding their leaders, verse 20 where Paul instructs them how to greet one another, and verse 22 where Paul instructs them about loving Jesus. Now, already, just making these kinds of notes will help us begin to see how a passage like this can apply to life, because all of these principles can relate to us, even if indirectly. So let's go back through these and just look at how we can apply this passage to our life, starting in verses 1 to 3. 
In verses 1 to 3, Paul is giving them instructions about taking up a collection for the saints in Jerusalem who are struggling with poverty and famine. Now, on the one hand, this is clearly prescriptive in nature. Paul is literally telling the church specifically what they are to do. They are to take up a collection for the impoverished believers in Jerusalem. In terms of how to go about doing this, Paul doesn't want one big collection when he arrives. He doesn't want some heavy emotional push on this collection. Instead, he rather just each person prayerfully and intentionally set aside money each week that he would just gather when he arrives. And so he instructs them to set aside some money on the first day of every week, which would be Sunday. And, and by the way, that also shows us that the early church started worshiping the Lord on Sundays. Uh, the amount they give would be determined by how much they have prospered. And when Paul arrives, they should choose someone to bring the money to Jerusalem and he'll write a letter for them to certify the amount, where it came from, who it's going to go to, and, and that all of this was under his oversight. Now, in terms of transferable principles, is there anything we can just glean for our lives here today? Well, definitely. For one thing, we should have an active care for those who are less fortunate. And if we're giving money to them, it should be done in a way that is reputable and above reproach. Likewise, if we're in church leadership, we need to make sure that the collections that we're taking are done orderly and fully accountable to those who give. We should also be wary of emotional appeals because the example that Paul is setting here is that when the Lord is involved, we don't need to twist people's arms. But also, that means that people need to be obedient to the Lord with what he would have them to give. Finally, as for our amounts to give, it's based on our own prosperity. The Old Testament rules of tithes are done away with, and yet the principle of generosity still stands that we should give in proportion to the Lord's prospering of us. And so it's wonderful when the Lord blesses us financially, but that blessing isn't just so that we could buy more stuff for ourselves, but so that we can be generous with the gifts he has given to us. And so those are some helpful principles for finances, and they transfer to our lives today. But as we go through the next set of verses, there is not a lot of prescriptive teaching. And so in verse 4, Paul's them that maybe he and one of their chosen couriers will bring them unto Jerusalem. In verses 5 and 6, Paul is letting them know the route he's going to take through Macedonia, that he might stay with them for the winter. He explains in verses 7 and 8 that this is because he doesn't want to see them just for a short trip, a little short little while. And not only that, right now he's, he's in Ephesus. And even though there's many adversaries to the gospel, the Lord has opened a door for effective ministry. And so he's going to stay there for a while. But in verses 10 and 11, Timothy might swing by. And if he does come by, treat him well because he's doing the Lord's work. And and that phrase, send him on his way in peace, was probably a way of saying, hey, can you give the guy some of what he needs because he's doing ministry? Likewise, in verse 12, Paul wants him to know he was encouraging Apollos to visit him, but Apollos doesn't want to right now, so he'll come by later when it's good for him. By the way, that's just another example of two fellow believers who see things differently, but are not going to let those differences drive a wedge between them. And so when you read a stretch of scripture like this, you may not necessarily come away with practical application for your life. But here's what you can do. You can look at this specific action that's being described and see if there's any spiritual or biblical principles behind them. One of my seminary professors called this the principle ladder. And, and when we're dealing with super theoretical truths, we need to kind of bring them down the ladder to appropriate application. And when we're dealing with super specific actions, we need to go higher up the ladder to the theological truth behind them. For instance, maybe you read verses 6 and 7, and you see that Paul wants to spend the winter with the Corinthians. And while that may not be a direct application, the higher principle is here that the Lord places tremendous value on people. And we can look at our own life and see if we're reflecting those values and how we're investing in people's lives around us. Maybe you read verses 8 and 9 and see Paul's perseverance in the face of difficult ministry in Ephesus. And if you're in ministry or, or doing some kind of service in the church, this is a reminder that it's not always going to be easy. And yet the Lord may open an effective ministry in the midst of that difficult position, that difficult post. And in those times, it might be best just to hang tight and keep up the work. And so those are just a couple of examples of how we can apply passages like this to our lives. If it takes skill, it takes practice. But we can learn to just go up and down that principal ladder, finding ways to apply the Word of God to our daily life. But having said that, we shouldn't lose sight of what Paul is really getting at in this passage. And so when we read passages that seem like we're reading someone else's mail, we will usually still find some clear universal principles. And in this passage, the thrust of this final chapter is actually verses 13 and 14. And so Paul says in verse 13, be on the alert, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong, 
Let all that you do be done in love. And so these are true principles for all believers in all times. And so be on the alert. The Corinthians who were just in this spiritual days, and it was time for them to snap out of it. And so these Corinthians needed to be on the alert for all the things that he has been talking about in this letter. Be on the alert for those who would rather pursue the wisdom of this world rather than the wisdom of God. Be on the alert for those who want to preach something other than the cross. Be on the alert for those who are living for today and not for eternity. Be on the alert for those who are being factious or those who are pursuing gross sin. Be on the alert for those who disregard God's principles for marriage. Be on the alert for those who would hurt a brother over things like dietary laws. Be on the alert for those who want to misuse and abuse spiritual gifts. Be on the alert for those who deny the resurrection. And so because of these threats, stand firm in the faith. Learn what Paul has taught on these truths. Know these truths. Cling to these truths as God's truths and hold fast to them and stand firm in the faith. Don't be easily persuaded by some loud, persuasive teacher who's just blown on in and who is not teaching in accordance with sound doctrine. Don't be easily persuaded by man's reasoning or popular opinion or the ways of this world. Don't be led astray. Stand firm in the faith. But this isn't going to be easy. So act like men and be strong. Now, that may sound like Paul is saying, guys, don't wimp out and, and probably saying something to that effect. But remember, Paul has been teaching them throughout this letter that they need to be godly, mature, spiritual Christians and stop acting like fleshly, immature, carnal children. And so be men, as in be mature, take responsibility for yourself and for those around you. Be strong. This is not going to be easy, but keep it up and press on to maturity. And so those are some clear principles for us. We need to recognize that there are spiritual threats all around us. Don't be complacent, stand firm, be mature, be strong. And then in verse 14, while you're doing all of this, let all that you do be done in love. As they carry out the principle of this letter in regards to how they work out their divisions with the teachers or how they deal with that guy of immorality in chapter 5 or how they iron out their lawsuits in chapter 6 or their marriage struggles in chapter 7, go about handling these situations in a way that demonstrates true brotherly love for one another. Don't do what's best for yourself. Do what's best for others. Love one another. Live out the biblical principles we've been seeing throughout this whole letter. And so that's the heart of this chapter. But we're not done yet. And so Paul drops back into some practical closing comments. And so it appears in verses 15 to 17 that three men had come to him from Corinth. That would be Stephanus, Fortunatus, and Achaeus. These men were sincerely devoted to the growth and the maturation of the Corinthian believers. And so Paul is calling this church to follow these men's leads. No doubt he has spent time with these men, building them up in these truths, giving them now this letter saying, go back and just take these truths and build up the church in Corinth. And so then in verse 19, he sends greetings to them from the churches of Asia. In verse 21, he writes these last words with his own hands, and that's because he's dictating most of this letter through a trained scribe that's called Amenuensis. That guy is writing down these words, but now Paul stops, and just for these final little closing comments, he writes them himself. And in his final words, he says that those who do not love the Lord will be accursed. And that is just a stark reminder for us to be sure that we're about loving the Lord. And there are a million good reasons for us to gather with God's people, but paramount among all of them must be our love for the Lord. And finally, in verses 23 and 24, Paul says, The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. My love be with you all in Christ Jesus. Amen. And with these closing words, we come to the end of this letter to the Corinthians. And so that's chapter 16, and that's this letter. Now, for the last couple of weeks, we've covered a lot of ground, and most of it's not been easy. We started out saying that this was going to be a difficult book that tends to irritate our flesh, and no doubt, as we went through it, we probably found times where we just wanted us to turn it off or, or just you know, move on to someplace else. If you've gone through this whole book, thanks for sticking around for this study. I, my hope is that as you know this book more fully, you will understand these truths and stand firm in them, that you yourself will take them to be the word of God that they are, that you'll press on to maturity, you'll be strong for the Lord in the Lord, and that your life will be doing and living out these things all in the love of the Lord. And so with that, thanks for listening to this podcast. Thanks for going through 1 Corinthians with us. And I look forward to starting 2 Corinthians with you tomorrow. And until then, have a great day and God bless.